There is only four days left to get in on the first ever Patreon members only fishing tournament on the Tourney X app. We only need four more individuals to sign up for the tournament so we can hit our major goal on sign up. The tournament is going to go from October 12th until midnight on Halloween. Registration is open now and it ends Monday, October 14th at midnight. You must be a Patreon supporter to enter this competition. For the $20 entry fee for the tournament, I am guaranteeing $100 for the biggest largemouth caught, $100 for the biggest smallmouth caught, $100 for the biggest rock bass, $100 for the biggest sunfish, and I'll be paying out a first place and a second place, and those numbers will be dependent on how many people sign up. Again, the tournament is $20 for Patreon members only, and to be a Patreon member and to help support Fishing the DMV, it's only $6 a month. And for that $6, which is less than a pack of Senkos or Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, loads of members-only content, our monthly photo contest giveaway, and of course, for this month, our Halloween Bash Fishing Tournament. Again, if you would like to join this community and join this really cool fishing tournament, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight for this belated Monday Night Live? Could you? Could I get a little sound check there? Sound check. How do I sound? Um, we're going to be, I'm going to be saying this a bunch of today but basically today was the quarter for the black bass advisory board for maryland that meeting it felt like it went from five till eight o'clock that's why we started so late generally speaking monday night live started at 7 p.m every monday night uh but when you have this black bass advisory meeting man it's just yeah what are you gonna do so i'm really sorry that i'm so late on this thing getting this out to you here's my plan we are going to break up monday night live this week into two parts part one is going to be tonight i'm going to be going over kind of what we are talking about what maryland's thinking about doing for 2025 when it comes to bass fishing and conservation and then tomorrow you're getting a bonus monday night live tomorrow i will be doing another live stream at 5 p.m 6 p.m tomorrow going through what's going on in the world of bass fishing that will be also a call-in show as well and i'll be talking about my season so you're going to get two live streams this week because i love all of you guys so much and for some reason Streamyard was messing up so so many things when i was trying to figure out how to move this thing around so luckily you know it is what it is we are where we are we're here where we are so without without further ado i'll put this right up on the board here this is the call in number we have tonight if you'd like to call in and just talk about anything you can 667-307-8583 uh let's get into what's going on in the old state of maryland again guys sorry i'm starting so late with everything here uh so here's the sit wrap uh today i think believe this started q1 for black bass advisory for 2025 the thing that we were talking about were the increases of uh, fishing license sales for Maryland. There's going to be a increase in how much it costs for fishing licenses for the freshwater fishing license in the state of Maryland. That is being pushed through the General Assembly because Maryland is behind every other state in the surrounding area by about 30 years. I don't think they've actually raised the fishing licensing price since I think Reagan was president and it kind of hurt them in a couple of ways financially for one is they just didn't keep up with inflation, the price of everything else. And so now they're so far behind, they don't know what to do because basically the state of Maryland was going to run out of money in I think it was like 2027, if I'm not mistaken, like the DWR would just flat out run out of money. So they have to raise fishing licenses. That's the big deal that that's going up and more will be coming out about those prices as it gets through the General Assembly. So that was the first thing that we talked about. The other thing that we talked about is Maryland DNR, they have a fish hatchery program. They have a bunch of ponds that they run for everything from trout to bass, catfish, you name it, you know, pr predominantly, you know, bass. And they now have a fund, a black bass advisory fund that is available to them to be able to generate money for projects. And the first project that they wanted to do just to give them a nice little win, a little, little win under their belt was to buy better uh, filters for the ponds that would it, it oxygenate the water so that that way they could produce more bass. And so that filter costs about $5,000. 
they are $1,500 away from getting these filters installed in their ponds so they can have hopefully a higher yield of bass. So what we're talking about doing is a charity tournament. I believe, I, I believe we're, we're working out where that's going to be. I don't want to say anything quite yet, but there's going to be a charity bass fishing tournament that's going to be put on by the Black Bass Advisory Board and the state of Maryland in 2025. And what we're hoping is this will be an annual event to generate money for bass fishing, black bass fishing in the state of Maryland. That's kind of this huge, big brained idea that we're starting with. Um, I believe right now we're kind we're thinking about should we limit it to 80 boats or just open it up and have as many boats as possible, the logistics around it. But we're hoping to generate enough funds to be able to pay for the bead filter and then also start being able to save up a slush fund to do different things when it comes to helping bass fishing in the upper bay and in the Potomac River. And potentially I'm hoping just to give some money to the smallmouth program as well. So I, I know that's just a lot I'm trying to dump on you, but I'm trying to go through like a four hour meeting that I had today with them and, and what's kind of going on with that bad boy again if you want to talk about anything the number is 667-307-8583 uh if you guys are just tuning in i'm sorry for for how uh, crazy this was uh every quarter we have a meeting with the maryland department of wildlife resources i'm a member of the black bass advisory board for maryland we go over policies and different things that we're doing for fishing in the state of maryland the meeting was like four hours long so again i apologize that i'm late to this and i'm gonna have another live stream tomorrow afternoon to go through more of the fun stuff um and then we have a couple of questions right here. We've got Chase Murphy. Chase Murphy, what did you catch them on at Lake Anna? Um, that's a real, let me go show you here. Now, I don't have the baits. I'm going to be going through this again tomorrow. Um, fish everything glide bait. So basically going into that tournament, Chase. So basically going into that tournament, I was in top 10 in points. Uh, and I felt pretty secure that I was going to finish the year in the top 10. I think I still did finish the year in top 10. I would have to check. I don't think Mike actually released it. Let me double check. I think he did. Yeah. So right now it looks like that I did finish in the top 10. That was my overall goal in going into the championship of Lake Anna. I've had no practice all year. I basically didn't practice very much for anything besides the upper Potomac. That was about it that I really practiced for bad on my part but my goal was still this year was to finish in the top 10 overall in AOI and I think I did and going to this tournament I really wanted to swing for the fence because it wasn't any more about points for me it was about trying to actually hit a home run and so Lake Anna is is renowned for jig bite and it's glide bait bite and so I literally just locked a glide bait in my hand in Sturgeon Creek and I just fished that and we are going to be going into massive depth about that tomorrow on the live stream and also what's going on around the bass fishing community in general but yeah so I locked a glide bait in my hand and I did enough damage to where I I believe knock on wood I think I did finish in the top 10 which was a big goal because this is the first full year the full year fishing circuit I have fished since 2018. So this is, I, I basically fell off the wagon when it came to fishing and committing to a whole tournament season since 2018. This was the year that I kind of got back into the saddle and to crack a top 10 in AOI is, that's the one in my book that really is, as I try to dust off the rust here and I'm not just talking fishing, but I'm actually doing the fishing, fishing portion of it. So that, that's a really good question and there's more to come on that. Um, Black Bass Advisory Board. Uh, we also had a gunpowder riverkeeper come on actually to talk about what's going on in the gunpowder. There has been some issues there with habitat restoration where it's getting, well, there's there's a reduction in, in subaquatic vegetation or, or, or grass that is definitely hurting the fish populations and gunpowder they foresee in the future. We talked about that. Uh, another thing is that they're just, they're overbuilding. There's a lot of zoning issues. Spoilers. We talked about this at like, like Gunnersville. Like how much have we talked about this at Lake Anna and Smith Mountain Lake? They just keep building houses in terrible places. So they are taking and people are somehow getting zoning permits to build on wetlands and they're creating massive runoff into the upper bay, the Potomac River. And they think this is one issue that you're having with so much grass dying. On the flip side, I uh, I really believe one of the big factors as to why <laughs> as to why you have this issue at Gunnersville is because they're having more housing developments and they're putting more fertilizer down that runs off into the lake. You have this explosion in the eelgrass. That's what I really think is going on there. All right, we got here. Uh, we got B cow. What bait should I be throwing at Nye this weekend? If the aerators are going on, 
if the air raiders are going on at nine, I would say a super fluke, a jigging minnow, something like that. It's going to be in like ice white is the best color I saw at the time when I was there. And you're casting that out and you're bringing that thing through as fast as you you can. You're trying to generate a strike when they're at those air raiders. Because what happens when those air raiders are on, dude, it's like a, it's a cloud of bait, an absolute cloud of bait. It's insane. So that's what I would suggest is using a jigging minnow something like that and then also another bait that seemed to really work there good is a uh, is a um uh it's a, a little swim bait a little swim bait worked there good as well that's a really good question uh oh, play pull that one back down there again guys the number is uh six six seven three oh seven eight five eight three again i'm sorry that i'm so late with this i'll be doing another live stream tomorrow as well also the little thing to talk about here is we have our tournament we have our patreon members only fishing tournament that starts this saturday i'll be doing a video sometime this crazy week to talk about the rules regulations and all that stuff if you're not a patreon member go join up it's 20 bucks we're giving away a ton of prizes and money it's only for my patreon supporters to say thank you i was told to say that and i did so back to the fun stuff so uh when it comes to the department of wildlife resources that was really the tack on it we are going to be trying to have a boat and kayak tournament next year to help fund some projects for the dwr boring stuff out of the way i know you guys like to talk about that uh, we can kind of get into some other stuff this week uh the Kerr tournament was insane did you guys see the weights from that good god i am getting those gentlemen on the show and i'm actually really really excited about that i'm getting the guy that actually won the event and i'm getting the guy that that finished in second place uh 21 pounds for one of the days is absolutely insane again it is uh let me get his names up here uh logan and jake came in first and second in that event. I'm going to be trying to get him on the show here later on. Probably going to be pre-recorded so I can drop that out. I have so many episodes backed up. I'm probably going to be doing one episode per week right now. Or one episode per week. I'm doing one episode a day this week going forward because of how many episodes I have. So you guys are going to have so much content. It's just going to make you guys giddy. I have another question right here from B. Cal Jr. What is the name of the tournament on the Tourney X app? Let me get that up for you, boss. That is a really good question that I should have available for you. Uh, the name of the tournament. The name of the tournament is should be the fishing. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. All right, cool. It's called the fishing the DMV members only event fishing the DMV members only event. Uh, here, I'll show you the sign up down below. Go right on there. You can sign up to that bad boy. And then when you sign up and uh, BCAL, if you go to Patreon, since I know you're a Patreon member, there's a password right there so you can log into the tournament. But it's called the uh, Fishing and DMV Members Only Event. Anyway, let's get back to more of the fun stuff. Pull that up there. My, my computer screen's now. You know, sometimes you just figure out that they just don't want you to have a live stream because nothing of my technology is working. Awesome. That's all back working. 21 pounds on Kerr was absolutely fascinating because it really, that place does fish. It seems like, and this is what I'm, you know, hold me to this here when I say this, but like a Florida lake where you will catch a massive weight one day and then you kind of just have to hold your lead through the whole thing. Um, and when you look at this right here, let me present my screen. There we go. So you're looking at the Kerr thing here. I mean, look at what Jake did. 21 pounds day one, six pounds day two, day three, he comes back with 11. And he's able to win. Look at what this says. 63, Jesus wept, $63,000. Wow, holy, that's a payday and a half. Um, but looking at these weights where you look at, like if this was just a day one tournament, okay, anyway, let's just go all day. So 37, 35, 35. Let's go with 35 pounds divided by three. So if you caught 11 and a half pounds each day, you finished in the top 10. That is remarkable to me. And again, like somebody cracked it. Again, I'm going to have Jake on. I'm going to talk to him about this because I'm interested about this. But 21 pounds. But this is where I say it reminds me of Florida when you have multiple day tournaments at Kerr. If you crack an 18 pound bag, it's going to, it's going to drop down hard and it's about maintaining that lead you see this in florida a lot where a guy like day one will catch a 30 pound bag and then each day it's dropping from 30 to like maybe 18 15 12 and it's just catching enough to stay par with those places because there's only so many big fish florida has this thing there are big fish in florida but there's not a lot of them when you compare it to like texas and other places where you're gonna every, every fish is solid it's usually a couple of big females and a bunch of bucks that kind of round out that bag and that's kind of the way Kerr fishes 
it's fascinating that they still had it there. It sounded like even with all of the debris and stuff, the tournament still worked out, which is which is fantastic to hear. I'm really glad that it wasn't a complete uh, bleep show out there, which I thought it was actually going to be like. Uh, we got here. We got Dave up here. Dave is like, uh, are you on tonight? Yep. Sorry about that. Again, if you guys are just tuning in, I'm be going live tomorrow evening for another call in show just to be talking about everything that's going on. I just want to make sure I stayed up on here to to make sure that I I didn't leave you guys hanging with what what is going on. Uh, the river was absolutely blown out this weekend. If you were fishing the Shenandoah, my goodness, that was insane, the amount of rain that we've gotten. But the Potomac looked really good. It's the upper Potomac up near where I am. So if you guys are trying to get out to do any type of fishing this weekend coming up, definitely look at the Potomac River uh, You know, from Williamsport all the way down. It's looking extremely good compared to the Shenandoah. And the Tidal River, like the biggest thing with Tidal right now is just all the debris. Like the, the water itself, because of the tide and how it cleans it out, is not too too terrible it's just all of that crap that just floated down river it's absolutely insane right now uh, again guys number is 667-307-8583 um, this week we have a couple of really cool episodes that are going to be dropping one of them is going to be about a guy that has caught almost every fish as a record as a state record absolutely crazy because what he gets into about like having to figure out like how do you catch a, a state record bluegill well, you got to figure out where you go for that. Well, how do you catch a state record pickerel? Well, you got to figure out where to do that. And so this guy does this Jeremy Wade thing of figuring out the best places to go to try to catch him. And you know what? We have a phone call today. We got five. Let me get this guy on the show here. Uh, all right. Five, four, oh, three, two, zero. You're on the show. Hey, hey boss. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. So good, good, good. So on the topic of the rivers being blown out, um, I fish in the Southwest Virginia area on the New River. And as you know, we just had uh, make the flooding, the largest flood we've had since 1940. Um, river still, it's back in its banks, but it's still chocolate milk color. Um, I was kind of curious uh, if you knew kind of what effect that might have on the fish going forward and if you know, the same fish are still nearby or if all the fish kind of got blown down, down river. That is something that we actually asked the Shenandoah river keepers when it comes to the, the high water events that we've had here, where does it blow fish away and stuff. And what's interesting is when you, the faster the current goes, it also creates a countermeasure of the faster the backflow is with eddies. So even in blowout currents, mm -hmm. uh, for anyone that have, that's listening or watching that's watched the travesty of the hurricane and you saw the flooding conditions, you could still, what's crazy is pick out eddies that were created by houses or debris and stuff. And so the fish in general will be okay because they can tuck inside those eddies and be okay. The greater environmental impact from this stuff is when it happens. So if this happened during like the spawn, those eggs are screwed because where the eggs would be put okay. would not be safe. And so let's say this did happen in June. You just lost a whole year of smallmouth. Um, and so I'm hoping based on history and what I've been told, this shouldn't be too terrible for the adult smallmouth. And we will, you know, I can say that to all I want, but it, we'll, we'll see this spring. But I'm pretty sure that the smallmouth population will be safe because it is fascinating that that's actually in Colorado what they use to control smallmouth in, in rivers that are trout streams. What they do is during May and June, they fluctuate the water to affect their spawning ability. And that's how they can curtail them because they're an invasive species in Colorado. So that's a really good question because that's fascinating. And I, it really sucks for what happened to you guys. I'm sorry to hear all of that. Yeah, yeah, we've seen some crazy devastation and I've been down there and looked at you know, seeing some big 18 inch smallmouth washed up on and heard of a uh, 52 inch muskie that got stuck in an empty in someone's yard, too. Mm. So, yeah, it's absolutely brutal, and there's but, definitely going to be some casualties for sure. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm way, way far away from the river, about 10 minutes away, so I don't, nothing happened to me, but just seeing some of the area, they, I think what have been crazy is what if you didn't have like a Claytor Lake dam, like would have been better or worse. I've always thought about that because you have so many people, so many tree huggers in the United States that hate all these lakes. And it's like, well, if we didn't have all these lakes would have, I think it would have made it way worse. 
Yes, it could have. The in nineteen forty when this happened, it got higher and I was without the dam. It got six foot higher. Mm. So and you know, the lake they released I think they released it like three foot, but they sh- they should have done it more yeah. and earlier. Um but yeah, by the end of it they were just going wide open, so it didn't really have too much of an effect. But and, and I really think and that's what's so I, I'm glad you brought this up. If for people that don't know, the New River can really be split between the portion from the Carolina working into Claytor Lake and then the portion after because New River flows north. So, yeah, so like when we say, well, okay, well, all the fish, you know, were pushed downstream. So, in theory, that just means Claytor Lake will be bitching because that is the dam for most of the New River, in theory. It's not going to be backed up into West Virginia or whatever. I'm more interested on, on the West Virginia portion of the river, honestly. Yeah, and also with you know all the water coming from the dam, I'm sure there's probably going to be a larger population of striper down in our area on the river too. Yes, yes, and, and will they be able to survive there? Like th- that's a population that'll be interesting. Like the the musky, I was wondering because like in general, like there's not as many musky on a river, generally speaking, than like a smallmouth population. So how will the muskies be affected? Because they're, I mean, generally speaking, there's very few musky per area compared. I know the new river is a little bit different. I think the sampling said like the new river has the most musky in it of any river in Virginia, but still, um, I don't know. I, I, I just, even if the river is perfectly fine, Let's just go with that. The problem is just the infrastructure has been just destroyed. Like, and and the new is in the middle of nowhere to begin with. Now, I just, how much is this going to hurt the guys? How much is this going to hurt, you know, commerce and things in the area? Mm. I've, yeah. I've definitely heard the kind of new above Clear Lake has been clearing up. So, and I've seen some of the guides going up there to, you know, keep doing the trips, but it's definitely still bad conditions below the dam. Have you ever thought about going, I don't know uh, like where specifically you live, but have you thought about going to the Murray or the upper part of the James and, and um, up in Lynchburg? Yeah, definitely thought about going to James. I've, I've been there a few times, but that's definitely going to be on my list if it doesn't clear up here in the next week or two. Yeah, I was going to say that that might be a little bit better. I, I, fishing the tail races might be a little bit better as well. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, dude, that that's absolutely freaking brutal. And if, if I could ask you, what is your biggest smallmouth that you've caught? Biggest smallmouth I've caught. The one, the biggest I've weighed was uh, five pounds, two ounces. I'm looking at it up on my wall of reproduction. So that's a massive, massive, and that was from the New River. Yeah. Uh huh. Ah, dude, that place is so cool. Yeah, I, this, this, Spawn was amazing this year. I mean, the pre-spawn fishing was great. Do you think when Hobie, the Hobie kayak trail went there uh, last year, do you think they went there at the best time to show off the river? When did they go? Uh, They went in July. No. No, I think, you know, I had the most luck this year, like early spring, like, I was still musky fishing and then randomly decided to smallmouth fish and just were catching just multiple big, you know, four pounders, four and a half pounders. That was in March. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. How was the fishing again before like the flooding came in? And then guys, if you want to come all call into the show, the number is six, six, seven, three Oh seven, eight, five, eight, three. Um, cause the fishing was starting to shape up here before the storm came in. Yep. Yeah, I believe if it, if you know the storm did not come this week, the temperatures are getting down in the 40s. I think you know this weekend or the following would have been the fall fall bite would have been on pretty good. I'm thinking there's going to be a good. Leading up to it, it was a little. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, leading up to the there's a little here and there. You know, you you were catching some good fish. They were definitely hungry and getting fat, but I think one one or two more weeks and it would have been on fire. I agree. Um, and that's the thing that's weird about here and, and your area specifically is you have weird, like you have weird weather it, it, cause you don't usually get like snow and super cold because of that weird pocket there in that Valley. Um, 
especially just watching like football games with, with Virginia Tech and things. And, and so what are the temperature differences there that really cue the fish up? Because up here, it's usually we get a couple of frosts and things like that, and the fish start moving. Yeah, I would say what I found in the last couple of years is just it's it's not as like uh, it kind of takes a little bit longer because we can like you said it fluctuates so much. Like earlier, a couple of weeks ago, we started to get down in the fifties and had I think it might have even gotten down in the forties one night, and I thought that that was it. I thought they were going to be on, but then the next two weeks it was all back in the sixties and seventies and eighties. So um, I think it takes a longer stretch of cool weather or consistent temperatures for them to really switch. I think so too. I also think a lot of it has to do with the light as well. I, I still, it's a weird crackpot theory because I, I just wonder like down South when it doesn't really change temperature, like what makes them move. And, and I think that light has something to do with it as well, where the vegetation starts dying and, and the leaves change and they know what's coming. Um, especially up here on the upper Potomac, Susquehanna, Shenandoah, where, we've had years where it doesn't get cold till like mid November and people in the chat, you know what I'm talking about. And you'll have like a really good fall bite in December and it's weird as shit, but that'll happen. And fall is weird to me. Cause I feel like we, we think of fall just as like October or Halloween and stuff, but that's not how like nature and stuff thinks of it. Like fall is just a time and a weather pattern change. Like spring is just rain and stuff before you get into the stability of summer. And spring is March almost into like June is technically spring. But I feel like once November hits, we as anglers are thinking like, okay, this is the winter time now. And it, it, it doesn't always play like that. Yeah. Well, boss, I really appreciate you calling into the show. Uh, you feel free to uh, reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, and I'm going to get you a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle uh, for giving me a phone call today. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. No, thank you, boss. All right, guys. Come on, give me a call, 667-307-8583. I'm going to be going through some of these questions that we have right here. Uh, the first one we have is, Shenandoah was perfect today. Not too high up and not too dirty. Definitely hit it within the next few days. Awesome, Seabird. Thank you so much for letting me know that. That's super duper awesome. Yeah, I was worried about the Shenandoah. I saw some of that really cool drone footage of, of splitting up between uh, the Harper's area where the Potomac and Shenandoah came in. And dude, the Shenandoah was like, whew. Dude, that thing was th thing was pumping out water, and I mentioned this with uh, with Chan. His episode dropped today. We're talking about chatterbait fishing and, and him being a god with it, and what he did in the Rappahannock River, and the fact that we caught the Shenandoah event with MVKBA like at the perfect time, even though it was like pissing rain. The water was just starting to come up a little bit and turn that nice color, and the fish had a feed bag on. I'm telling you, like it was chatterbait swim jig central with what how you could fish for it it was perfect timing if you waited two days it probably would have been blown out but that's the thing with like river fishing like there are these windows that you have to go through and that's the hardest thing with fishing rivers is you kind of like it's hard to be like oh in two weeks i'm gonna go fishing well, the weather is it just moves so much on those on those places uh we got sea bear again uh caught plenty of smallies and catfish too spro rock crawler 50 rock crawler is the shit i love those crankbaits i'm gonna do a crankbait show here at some point Ooh, do i have some i am a bum when it comes to this stuff i really am i mean but i got spro braids I got Spro's up the bum though. Uh, where is, I got some old school wiggle warts. This is not my primary crankbait box. But you know another great one that I really like is the DT4. DT4 uh, bomber, still got a little tight lip on it, but I just like that noise. You hear that, that really hard thud right there? Absolutely banger. And then the bandits, bandits and rock crawlers. I love. I think there's something in the rock crawler box. There you go, find that. That's really good. Again, guys. All right, let's go there. Let's go here. Uh, see, November is my favorite time to hit Lake Anna. No, Lake like Lake Anna is weird because like Lake Anna did pretty good this weekend. Honestly, all considered. Uh, and I know I'll be getting into this a lot more tomorrow as well. So I mean, I'll double dip. Who cares? You guys want to hear the information twice? Uh, um. <sighs> 
Kayaking is fantastic for me emotionally because I'm learning so much stuff that I want to implement. I want to get back into bass boat fishing. I do. I, I mean, I act like I don't. I still have the bass boats out there rotting. And I want to fish the BFLs and toys and all that stuff at some point. But to me, it's like you have to earn reps and build up. And to me, this this kayak fishing this year has been so good for me, learning a different way to view things when it comes to tackle presentation that you have to grind and learn an area. You know, when you cannot run spots in a kayak like you can in a bass boat, and that's a poison to your mind. But when you get dumped in sturgeon and you just fish sturgeon, you learn sturgeon, you talk to sturgeon, you visit sturgeon on the weekends, you know what sturgeon likes for dinner. And you, oh, okay, the fish are like right in here now. I'm like, oh, they're really hot. They're up in the grass. And these docks are what's playing. I just feel you get so much more intimate with an area. And that's what I've really appreciated with this is, is how I'm starting to learn areas. And when you're forced to sit in a creek, again, this is what hits me. There's so many damn fish in these creeks. There's so many. When you when you have five different people on a kayak all catch limits, and there's a couple of boat guys that catch limits, and you realize, and then you, I caught a couple, and, and then you realize like, oh, huh. I, if I was in a boat, I would have driven in here taking two casts and left. When there was plenty of fish, there was like, there was at least 30 keepers caught out of Sturgeon Creek. It, it, like, and that's fascinating to me. It blows your mind because again, as a boat guy, the idea is just leave, just leave, run spots. That's effective. People do that and are extremely effective with it. But then it's just this weird changing the mindset from my college years, my high school years of well, if you get locked in here and this is your lake, can you catch them? And that's such a different mindset for me to learn. But I want to learn that trait effectively because I feel like there are tournaments everyone has an angler where that's what you got to do. It's not pretty. There's no form. It's basically you line up and you just start throwing punches and you just got to catch them wherever you're at. And that's a hard skill to learn. So I've been really, really, really enjoying that part of it with Lake Anna with that. Um, and then, you know, like, like Sea Bear was saying, like B Cow was saying as well, the smallmouth fishing is going to get pumped here too. Uh, November's coming. I'm really excited for that. I am, I am really thinking about doing something super special. I am going to be hopefully doing a wintertime Patreon fishing tournament as well. I wanted to do something like that. It's just going to be a smallmouth event completely. Probably going to be the battle of the upper tournament versus the Shenandoah River is what I'm thinking to do at first um, because I have so many Patreon members that are right there in that hub, but I don't want to like interfere with anybody else. It's just to, again, say thank you for you guys and everything that you've done. Um, I got Sea Bear again. Sea Bear is uh, uh, Jared and I were on the phone talking about the same topic. I don't think people realize how many fish they are around when it comes to Anna. It's just where they are and when they want to bite. I, I, absolutely. Um, J Nolan Miner, I had Nolan Miner on the show, and this was before he won on the Susquehanna River for back when he was he was little. He only had like two thousand YouTube followers and all that. And he said something that was so just, you could dismiss it, but it stuck with me profoundly. It's like when he went from fishing the opens in a bass boat to kayaking. And he said, like, when I got a kayak and I had forward facing sonar and I got to pan forward facing sonar around, I realized how many fish are in the creeks that we just fish over and we don't know how to figure them out. And that just, that blew my mind. I don't know why it just, it did like, and again, there's a counter argument to like, Oh, well, you know, what you need to do is you need to find 38 brush piles and you run each one on the 15th hour of each day and you're gonna have success, you know, and that's not what's happening. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. Like, cause again, there's so many people that win that way, which is fine. But to me, it's learning that different style to not run because you need to be able to run that style. You need the time. You need the reps. I mean, some of these guys that win these terms like a Kerr, they have 10 years of experience. The guys that win at the James River, they have 30 to 40 years of experience. Well, of course, those people can run the tide. Of course, the people know like this stick in the Chickahominy when the high tide is at half crest on a full moon, there's a four pounder that sits there. Well, shit, good for you. Yeah, you should go run all those spots. There is no way in this lifetime I think I could learn that. So what style would work for me? Well, it's going to be like, I'm going to sit in this creek all day and I'm going to pick it apart so I know it by name. And then you learn the micro patterns about where those fish set up. And it's interesting when you rotate a, a creek like that and you keep going in a circle and how you fish a dock and there's nothing on it. 
and you go back there in the second rotation, there's a fish on it. And you're like, that's crazy. You go down a, a bank of water willow, nothing there. That's a little bit sunnier. It's a little bit calmer. You start seeing bluegill out here for some reason. They weren't there before. You throw your bait there, boom, you catch one. It's like, oh, where were they earlier? It's just, that to me is fascinating to me, like how that works. But again, we would just roll right past them. The spinnerbait bite was good on Lake Anna. Um, the topwater bite was still in action. There was a, um, a, a bait fish bite as well. I don't have four fishing center on my kayak though, so I was not getting into that. I will be having the winners on though for that tournament and also AOY as well. So we'll be talking about that as well this week. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I really hope the new river stays okay though. I do. It, it's going to be interesting to see you know, the scientists and the people that are the specialists say like, well, the, nothing bad's going to happen. So I can only go based on what they say, but you worry when it's a flood that's a hundred years, like that's insane. That's a really insane flood. And I think anecdotally, when we look at it, we're going to say it's bad, but we hope that it's not, you know, that's the thing is we just got to hope that it's not. Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting. It will be a lot of interesting stuff to come through there. Anyway, guys, so that's the deal with this show today. This was a quick one. This was just trying to kind of wet your palate for what is going on. Here is the plan. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., I will be doing another live stream to talk to you guys about what happened, my year completely. And I'm also going to be trying to get on a special guest as one as well. So again, tomorrow we're going to do another live stream to go over all that stuff. Next week will be a Monday. It'll be a Columbus Day, I believe it is. Is it Columbus Day? It is Columbus Day. I'm going to have on a special guest. I'm trying to get him lined up right now to really go over everything, but it is going to be absolutely fun. Uh, let's see. You talked about this a while back. Watch the Japanese anglers and how they break a single creek down and catch a big and catch it back. Yeah, no. They are what are inspiring me going through this crusade right now. Kayaking is making me a better boat angler. I know it will. I know when I make the transition back to my boat and I start fishing the BFL thing, I'm not going to be a good angler because I'm going to realize... If you pick a creek that has six big bass in it, there's a mindset difference with the Japanese anglers, uh, I think, personally, that, oh, there's six big bass in this creek. I'm just going to catch those five to six bass, period. A Western angler is, oh, I need five to six big fish. I'm going to run around the lake and try to find them. Find them. The big fish guy, the Japanese big fish guy is, oh, they're here? Well, if they're here, I don't have to find them. I'll just figure out how to catch them. And it's such a different mindset because we have so much water. Again, I, I know everyone likes to complain around here that, you know, all we have is the Potomac River and Lake Anna is too tiny. You know, every Japanese kang angler would kill to have a Lake Anna sized lake in Japan. You know how much they would kill to have a Lake Chesden or, or any of these places or the Res or Lake Frederick for that matter. They are, they have such overpressured places that it just changes the way that their mindset is. And again, you can win with this just run and gun, but I think it takes time to learn that you need the places you need to know where to go to do that. I can run a gun a little bit on the Potomac, but I am nowhere near the same quality river rat that these other guys are the same thing. If you put me on the Susquehanna river, I get my ass kicked by Jake and every other person that lives in Pennsylvania because they know that river so well, they could run and gun. But that takes so much time. And I think the issue with younger anglers is if you don't have that experience yet, don't try to do it. Don't try to don't try to play that game if you're not good at it. Just pick an area, pick it apart, because then you'll know that area. If you just stay in Sturgeon Creek for two tournaments in a row and never leave it, you will know every rock, dock, and weed in that place and then leave and go to another creek and do that. And all of a sudden, over a couple of years, you'll have all this built up. Um, but it's the same thing. Like It's just hard to pre-fish. If you pre-fish, let's say Sturgeon Creek, I don't know why I'm beating on Sturgeon Creek this much, but if you pre-fish Sturgeon Creek two days in a row and never leave, you will have fished everything in there. You will waypoint, let's say if you bend your hook, every place you got a bite. When you go tournament day, that is efficient as hell compared to the other thing. Now, granted, if you've been to Lake Anna before or you're willing to graph all day, you could potentially win at Lake Anna too. But it's just it's a mindset thing. It's just a mindset thing. Anyway, guys, so uh, I really apologize that I started so late. That was not the plan because of the Black Bass Advisory meeting that ha happened. I really, really apologize for that. If you would like to, please go sign up for the Patreon Members Only Fishing Tournament. You have to be a Patreon member. I'm guaranteeing $100 for Big Bass, Large Mouth, Small Mouth, 
rock bass, okay, and bluegill. That's it. Then plus I'm going to be paying out to the first and second place as well, depending on how many people that we get to sign up for it. That starts this Saturday and it runs through Halloween. It's going to be an absolute blast. If this works and you guys like it, we'll be doing more tournaments like this as well. Tomorrow at 5 p.m. we're doing another Patreon or not Patreon. We're doing another live stream to supplement what happened here tonight because I do apologize for how badly this went out. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.